Hey, Invertebrate Zoology. Um, welcome to our very last lecture of the craziest semester in history. Uh, and it's going to be on worms. Uh, nice to finish out strong with some worms. I tried to teach myself how to do the worm last night so I could do it for this video. Uh, but I can't do it. And now my hips are just bruised from trying to do it. So sorry about that. You'll just have to look at all these pretty pictures I have of worms instead. So let's do it. Let's talk about platy hill nymphs. Okay, so today we're talking about the phylum platyhelminthes. And so before you watch this video, make sure to download your learning goals off of Schoology so that you can fill them out while you watch the video. Let's go back. Hey, remember this from the beginning of the semester? This phylogeny where we mapped, mapped out key evolutionary novelties onto? Remember this? These are all the animals. There's us all the way down here. Just one tiny little branch in the entire kingdom, Animalia. And here's where platy helminths are. Up here um, at the base of the bryozoans, the foron and nidids, the br brachiopods, and other worms, annelids, nemertias, other, other worms. But today we're talking about the platy helminths. Uh, platy means flat. Helminth means worm. So today we're talking about flatworms, uh, and there's about 20,000 species of flatworms. Um, your book says that um, phylum platyhelminthes is likely polyphyletic, but um, I'm not sure when that was written. According to this uh, transcriptomic and phylogenomic study, which is like whole genome data and whole gene expression data sets, um, it looks like actually platyhelminthes, which is this whole group right here, uh, actually is monophyletic. So according to the most recent phylogeny of this phylum, they're a monophyletic single group with a single shared common ancestor. So that's cool. It's a real thing. Um, your book also says that they likely represent um, the most closest living example of a primitive body plan that gave rise to all bilateria. Um, I, I think that consensus might, might not be true so much anymore now that this new paper came out recently that I shared with you on Slack. Um, just came out in February. The description of this new fossil, this bilaterian fossil that might represent like the ancestor of all bilateral animals. This, um, I thought this fossil didn't really look like much when I was reading through this paper, but um, I think that the most convincing evidence that this is a bilateral animal and not just a dimple are the trails that were left in the rocks by the organism. And here's just a reconstruction of what that animal might have looked like. Uh, and it was found in the Ediacaran um, fossils, which are about 635 to 542 million years ago. So. Bilateral animals been around for a while. Here's some general characteristics of the flatworms. Um, for the ones, they can be free living, terrestrial or aquatic. Um, they um, can will glide along a substrate using um, mucus and ventral ciliary reaction. Um, and some of the aquatic ones that you see here, they can actually swim by undulating. That's what these flatworms are doing, these marine ones. Over half of this phylum are parasitic. And they'll have, and we'll go through some of my favorite examples, because uh, y'all know I love parasites. We're going to go through that they have a derived or degenerate body form. So we've talked about that with parasites before, where they've co evolved closely over millions of years with their hosts, and they've lost a lot of features that they might have needed when they were free living, but now, uh, a lot of them are just tubes with mouths to feed off of their hosts. They can be herbivorous, they can be carnivorous, they can be omnivorous. Um, and the free living ones, like all these examples here on this slide, um, they tend to be scavengers or active hunters, and many of them um, also feed on bacteria. So lots of diverse 
feeding strategies and habitats that they can live in. Um, but if they are in terrestrial habitats, like we've talked about with most other worms, um, they tend to live in moist environments because um, of some characteristics we'll talk about in a second. So let's talk a little bit about their morphology and their anatomy. They're bilaterally symmetrical, uh, they're triploblastic, and they're acelomate. If you uh, think back to the phylogeny I showed you, um, they are a reversion from that coelom um, earlier on in the animal kingdom. They've re reverted back to not having a body cavity. So they, these are the three defining characteristics. All of these together are the defining characteristics of this phylum. They also have a dorsoventrally compressed body plan, um, which is why they're called flatworms. Some of them have very, very cute um, anterior, anterior dorsal uh, photoreceptors. Um, and then uh, they'll have a ventromedial mouth with a pharynx, kind of a weird place for the mouth to come out. Um, and they have a high surface area to volume ratio. So they do gas exchange right across the ectoderm through diffusion, which is why we talked about a lot of worm, vermiform-shaped animals um, will have gas exchange right across their skin, which means they have to stay moist because they have a real risk of desiccation. Um, so that's why even the terrestrial ones you'll find in moist environments. They don't have any respiratory or circulatory systems. And um, Regardless of whether or not they're free living or endoparasitic, they have to be in a moist environment. They have this really strange digestive system um, that connects to all of their cells, um, so that they don't have. So they, it connects to each of their cells to give them nutrition, which is really weird. And then they also have a blind gut, which means they take food in their mouth and then they poop out their mouth. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some general reproductive uh, strategies for this group. For the most part, they're hermaphroditic. Um, and one thing I wanted to clear up from, um, I think it was a lecture on nematodes. I misspoke about something. There's a, a major difference between self-fertilization and asexual reproduction. And we're going to talk about um, a form of hermaphroditic self fertil well hermaphroditic fertilization in a second. But asexual reproduction, there is not the fusion of sperm and egg into a zygote. Asexual reproduction comes from an unfertilized egg. When a hermaphroditic organism self fertilizes, it doesn't participate in copulation, but it is using its own sperm to fertilize its own eggs forming a zygote. So they may not be mating with another organism, but they are fertilizing their own eggs. And so that is actually self-fertilization by a hermaphrodite is still sexual reproduction. Asexual reproduction is only when you have unfertilized eggs developing into adults. I just wanted to make that clear because those are two very different things. Um, in this group, eggs are laid in egg masses. Here are some eggs of a terrestrial planarian. And then their larvae are called uh, Mueller's larvae. These are just some of the different kinds of, um, oh, these are just different stages of development within one type of platyhelminth. This would be the Mueller's larva stage here. Oh, and we're going to talk about what's going on here. So um, your book has these grouped up by old taxonomic classifications that don't really hold up anymore. A lot of these groups that we're going to use the names of have been determined to be polyphyletic, which means they don't share a single common ancestor. But they're really useful for looking at morphology in the group, so we're going to still use them. So first we're going to talk about the turbillaria. Uh, there are about 45,000 species of turbillaria. Most of these are free living. Um, these are just some of the prettiest forms I found on the internet. These are called uh, hammerhead worms down here. Um, planaria are included in this group, even though I didn't picture them here. Um, these are some marine flatworm species. And most of these are carnivorous. They're active predators or scavengers. Um, 
This group, the group tur Turbularia, are particularly known for asexual reproduction via body division or budding. So this is um, asexual reproduction that doesn't even come from an unfertilized egg. This is from cutting an animal up into pieces, and then each piece grows into a new whole animal, um, which is a really unique feature of Planaria. And I uploaded the, these are all gifts from a PBS Deep Look documentary that I, cre I put a link up on Schoology for you guys to look at. And the reason that you can chop up a little Planaria and each little section turns into, so this is right after it got chopped up, this is the head segment starting to grow a new body, and these are the these body segments turning into full-grown adults later. Um, the reason they can do this is because of pluripotent stem cells. Um, and pluripotent means that they have the potential, they have these stem cells to that have the potential to form any part of the body and specialize later. The reason you can cut them up and they'll do this is because one-fifth of their body is made up of pluripotent stem cells. Um, humans have very, very few pluripotent stem cells, but um, that's why we can't sprout new organs after we lose them or sprout new limbs after we lose them. Um, but planaria, because of their regenerative abilities, are important models um, for regenerative medicine research. Um, another really weird thing that this group does that is um, an interesting biological phenomenon is that um, they some of the hermaphroditic marine species will engage in something called penis fencing and traumatic insemination. And you'll remember the word traumatic insemination from our lab um, when I showed you that video on bed bugs. Um, so they have... So what you'll see going on in this video, uh, these white things here... Each flatworm has two penises, and each one has these dagger-like stylets on the end of it. Um, and they basically stab each other with their sperm, and that's why it's called traumatic insemination. They don't copulate with genital openings. They just stab each other and insert their sperm into each other in random places to fertilize each other. Um, and they just inject it right into... Um, into them. It's called hypodermic insemination in this group specifically because their penises have stylets on them. Um, they can either compete with each other where one individual is transferring sperm to the other or they can transfer sperm bilaterally so they stab each other with their paired penises. Um, and it all depends on the species. So this is just one species. This is another species from a research paper I was looking at. Some species will actually just deposit um, the sperm on the skin and then it gets absorbed through the skin. This group here actually has stylets that pierce through the skin and inject the sperm into their body. <laughs> it's crazy and really cool. So that's the turbularia. Now let's talk about the trematodes. Um, this entire group are parasitic and it's really the defining feature of the trematodes is that they are all parasites. Um, some of them are ectoparasitic, some of them are endo, uh, for the subgroup monogenia, um, these are ectoparasitic and they have a simple life cycle. So we're going to talk th about the monogenia and the diagenia. Um, the monogenia are called monogenia because they have only a single primary slash terminal host. So that's why they are called the monogenia. Um, they can be a particular problem for farmed fish. Um, here's the life cycle of one monogenia flatworm um, that affects the gills of fish. They have um, these things called hapters, which are hooks that they use to attach to the skin or gills of their host. Um, and they can have a prohapter, which is near their anterior, near their mouth, or they can have um, an opus hapter, which is hooks on the posterior, and those can be suckers or claws and hooks. And so in this way, they're a little similar in body plan to leashes in that they're very, very degenerate, and then they have attachments on their anterior and their posterior, but they are not related to leeches. They're in a completely different phylum. Um, and so again, and then they also have um, this larval stage here called the Oncomyricidium, um, and it has posterior attachment hooks that help it attach to a, no, a new host. So these are the attachment hooks on that Oncomyricidium in the monogenia. 
Now let's talk about the Digenia. Uh, this, the common name for this group is uh, flukes, and one really weird thing about this group is that they are syncytial. What syncytial means is that their ectoderm has very thin, kind of vague cell membranes, and so the cytoplasm that's in their cells basically surrounds the entire animal. They basically have one single cytoplasm because they have very thin and weak cell membranes between their cells. That's what syncytial means. Really strange. Uh, this group, they're all endoparasites to contrast them with the monogenia. And they have um, an initial host, an intermediate host, and then they have a terminal or definitive host. I'll repeat that. So they have an initial host, an intermediate host. Sometimes they'll go through two intermediate hosts and then they'll have a terminal or definitive host. In the digenia, the in initial and the intermediate hosts are very commonly snails, and the definitive hosts are always vertebrates. Um, this is just one example that you actually looked at in lab. Um, this is a liver fluke that can affect people. And they'll have really complicated, so this digenia can also have um, really complex larval stages that they'll go through. Um, first, they have this myricidium, which is the swimming or ciliated larval stage. Um, so first here, this is, um, this is another fasciola species, um, a liver fluke. Uh, so here's the egg. This is the myricidium. The myricidium is um, like a swimming ciliated larval stage, so you can kind of see the hairs around it. Um, and then they have the sporocyst stage, and the sporocyst is going to produce what's called a redia. Um, so C and D here are both uh, sporocyst. This is just a young one. This is a mature one. And then E and F are both examples of redia. And so the redia is produced by the sporocyst. Um, and the redia has a mouth, a pharynx, and a gut, and um, it's going to contain the cells that give rise to other redia forms or to the cercaria. So you can see here on the redia, it's got a mouth, and it's got a little more morphological definition than the sporocysts or than the myricidium. And then the cercaria are these free-swimming larvae. They're really easily distinguishable um, from the rest of them because they have this kind of like head and then this tail that enables them to swim. Um, and this allows them, the cercaria is the stage that's going to pass from the intermediate host to another intermediate host or to the t final vertebrate host. So this is the one that allows them to pass from one host to another. This is the cercaria. And then after the cercaria, they have this um, metacercaria stage. And this is this encysted encapsulated late stage larva, um, which is the form that's usually infective for that vertebrate host in those late stages. And then this is just a development after the metacaria of the fluke within a, in a host. Look at their gross little mouth. They're nasty. Um, oh, and yes, this is a liver fluke from an albino mouse. And then in terms of reproduction and development for these flukes, um, they can alternate between asexual and sexual phases. Um, and then the, yeah. And then the sexual phase occurs in the definitive host. So the definitive host of parasites is determined by the one that they are sexually mature in and reproduce in. So, and in this case, it's always a vertebrate with these digenia. So now we're going to talk about one um, really common example of uh, this digenia, and this is the schist schistosoma parasite. Um, it causes schistosomiasis, which is actually a very common disease in third world countries. The eggs of this are released into the water through feces or urine from the definitive host. So in this case, this is a human. This is a... Um, an infographic from the CDC on schistomiasis. Um, the eggs hatch and they release the myricidia that we talked about. That's that ciliated larval stage um, that can swim. 
And then the Mericidia infect an intermediate host, which is a snail, usually in the Digenia. Um, and depending on the Schistosoma species, it'll be a different type of snail. And then inside the snail, they're going to have two generations of sporocysts. And then it leaves the snail as the cercaria, so that weird thing that has a weird head and a tail. Um, that's the cercaria. And then that is what is going to reinfect the human. So the cercaria then penetrate into the human skin, usually by swimming in infected waters. Um, and then after entering the host, they become this unusual stage called the schistosomuli. I don't know if I did pronounce that right. Um, but basically they just shed their weird little swimming tail once they get in there. And then they will travel through your veins. Um, so they get into your skin, they go into your veins, they head up to your lungs, and then they move through your heart, and then they move down to your liver, um, and then in your liver is where they'll mature, reach sexual maturity, and then they'll leave via portal veins, um, and then that, and then in the portal veins, in your guts is where the male and female worms will mate. Um, and then the females lay eggs in the veins around the bladder and in the intestine. So the, they're going into these veins in the mesentery so that they can then get their eggs either into your bladder or into your intestine so that you can then shed their eggs via your feces or your urine so that the cycle can start all over again. Um, one other really weird thing about schistosoma is that uh, they make these really weird pairs. So this this big male carries that thinner. So inside of that male is actually the female. It carries the male carries the female around in this groove where he feeds and shelters her while she's producing eggs. Um, and they live inside your veins. They're so weird. Y'all know I love parasites. This is a particularly strange one um, that is of global importance to human health. And then we're going to talk about another one that doesn't infect humans, but I really, really love. Um, and this is um, Leucochloridinium paradoxum, or the green banded bro brood sac. Um, in this one, the Myricidia stage moves into the digestive system of the snail and then it develops into a sporocyst and the sporocysts in this group develop into these long tubes that form brood sacs um, that are filled with hundreds of those swimming cercariae. The brood sacs then move their way into the snail's tentacles so usually the tentacles that attach to the eye stalks um, and they turn their eyeballs basically into these bright crazy disco lights and what they do when these brood sacs full of cercaria are pulsing like this is they make them much more visible to birds and then birds come and they eat them and birds are the definitive uh, terminal host of these so the other thing that they do is that these sn infected snails because their eyeballs are infected they're more prone to wander into the light because they have reduced photoreception and so they just wander out into the light ready to get eaten um and then inside the bird is where the cercaria develop into the adult in their digestive system and then they make their way out of the bird basically very similar to the schistosoma through their feces snails eat the feces and start the cycle all over again aren't they crazy i love it Okay, now let's talk about the cestoda. Um, there are about a thousand species of these. The common name for these are tapeworms. You saw these in the parasite lab that we had before campus closed down. In these, the intermediate host is a vertebrate species, and then the definitive host is another different vertebrate species. And the way that these things eat is that they get their food from the digestive tract of their hosts. And the really strange thing that they do is they just they take up nutrition right across through their skin. So they're like basically a sack with almost nothing in them besides hooks and suckers that they use to attach to the inside of your intestines. Um, they have a scolex, which is basically like their head region, um, and it's got all these hooks 
and attachments on it um, to attach the in intestinal tract of the host. And then they are made up of, the other weird thing is they're made up of these segments called proglottids. Um, we had a segment on a slide for the invertebrate, or for the in parasite lab that we had. They're made up of all these se segments. And when the segments are mature, they're full of fertilized eggs that just shed into the feces. Um, and then the eggs are then ingested by their intermediate hosts, which can be pigs and other things. Um, and then the how people get them um, or how cats get them, they're pretty common in outdoor cats too, is that the larval stages will insist into the muscle tissue of their in intermediate hosts. So like in the muscle tissue of pigs, they'll insist inside of them and then when like a cat or a person eats this muscle tissue that has these insisted larval stages in it then that's how they infect their definitive hosts so um but it's really easy to kill these things if you freeze and cook your meat so don't be i'm sure none of you are but don't go eating raw pig meat <laughs> Don't go eat, eating raw pork anytime soon. Uh, just freeze and cook your meat, and it will kill any of these tapeworms that might be insisted in the muscle tissue. Um, yeah, they're gross. So that's it. That's everything for our last lecture of the semester. I'm so proud of you guys for sticking through everything that we've been to, to, through together and um, if you didn't see the survey that I posted, the Google form that I posted on Schoology, please fill it out. I bought little presents to congratulate all of you, and I'd like to send them to you in the mail. If you filled it out and you didn't include your name, please redo the survey because some of you, I just have an address that's not associated with a name. So redo that. Um, that's it. That's all I've got. Um, again, I'm so proud of you guys. For sticking through if you're seniors what a way to end the semester if you're juniors this is probably going to be one of the hardest semesters of your life um, I'm really proud of you okay I'll talk to you soon bye <laughs>